I've heard some amazing things on my TED lecture series on addiction. We've heard about my uncle Ozzy, who after a quarter century quit four pack a day smoking habit one afternoon based on a coworker saying 10 words to him. Uh, we've heard about Rat Park, where rats previously habituated or addicted to morphine solution quit when they were put in a large enclosure with three other same sex rats and four opposite sex rats. And they were allowed to prowl around, have fun and have sex. And we contemplated what we learned about Vietnam, where a large group of men were exposed to heroin. Some of them became addicted, but even those who became addicted in Vietnam, when they were allowed to become reintegrated in the United States into their home communities, quit their addictions in virtually every case. All of this tells us that the overwhelming bulk of addiction, causality and recovery occurs outside of the therapy setting. Ozzy, rats don't do therapy for the most part. And Vietnam soldiers, hardly any of whom of those men who recovered underwent treatment. Now, Nora Vocal became the head of the National Institute on Drug Abuse in 2003. She's been in there quite a while now. Um, and at for the first decade anymore, she often issued the mantra, it's all about the dopamine. Now, we're not gonna talk about that right this second. Very late in the game, she visited Philadelphia in December, 2019. Remember, she started at her job in 2003. This September, she wrote in December, 2019, I was invited by Thomas Farley, the health commissioner of Philadelphia to see firsthand how that city is responding to the opioid crisis. With other members of NID leadership, we toured Prevention Point, a private nonprofit organization providing harm reduction services to Philadelphia. Whenever I ask people on the front lines of America's drug crisis what more we can do to support and help their work, they remind me how essential it is to address the basic needs of individuals with addiction, such as stable and safe housing, food, basic medical care, and an opportunity for employment. Gosh, she learned that in 2019 after 16 years as being head of the NIDA. She went on to write in our uh, blog as director of the NIDA, it is crucial to realize that these needs have to be met even before a person is in stable recovery in order to facilitate them getting to recovery at all. People cannot recover from addiction if they are homeless, isolated, and struggling to find food and safety. Neurovoco is never going to get the message. So let me try and clarify what she almost could have learned and still hasn't learned. These basics that she mentions, having a purpose in life, an education or a job, personal resources, income, coping skills, living arrangements, health, having a community and intimacy, they don't facilitate recovery. They are recovery. It is somebody who is fully integrated according to their health, their residence, their community, their purpose, who is somebody who is recovering. Because we don't mean by recovery that they're not taking heroin or other drugs or taking it. 
we mean by recovery that people are living as good a life as they are capable of and in, improving and expanding outward. So now the question becomes, and it's a difficult question, how do you allow people and encourage people to gain these elements in their lives? Uh, and the number one step which Norvoco is incapable of making is first recognizing that these are your goals, that the recovery process is a matter of finding purpose, skills, housing, health, community, intimacy, and meaning in your life. And now the question becomes, how do you encourage yourself to find these things? Let's get away from the Kensington place, the Kensington community, uh, where Nora Volka visited. By the way, when I grew up, I worked in a shoe store in Kensington, Philadelphia, which my father owned. So uh, this is really touching my roots. And how do you encourage these things and treat them by first recognizing that they're your goals? By telling by not focusing with people on whether or not they're using a drug, although you'll discuss with them how and why they're using a drug, or whether or not they're in a destructive love relationship or a destructive relationship with food or a destructive relationship with gambling or sex. What you're going to talk to them about is meeting these signposts in life. Uh, how do you proceed then? We'd have to do the whole program of life process program for me to explain that to you. But let me just describe or even ask you, how would you go about, if you were a helper, encouraging a human being to pursue purpose, meaning education or work? How would you as a helper go about helping people to find and have a place to live? How would you as a helper help people to attain skills and acquire personal resources? How would you as a helper work with people to allow them to become a part of a community and to achieve intimacy? Well, those are the fundamentals in life, aren't they? Um, many of us have had that kind of exposure in our own lives or as parents, perhaps. They involve allowing people to create all of the key signposts that you need to live a complete life. And they're not difficult things to conceive. Well, you get people to apply to school, to apply themselves to school, to seek out skills that are employable to function better with other human beings, to encourage them to learn how to interact better, both with the relationships they already have, for example, their family, or in the quest to meet new people. And finally, you encourage them to be as much as possible a part of a larger community. And we in the Life Process Program don't want to limit that community to other recovering addicts or alcoholics. We want the community to be the broader community of the world that you live in. When you can help people to achieve all of these things, as tricky, as difficult, as sequential, as incremental as that is, only then are you able to allow people to achieve recovery from addiction. 